the disciples, how they had problems in the church and how they were, we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks, how they were having problems with what was going on in the first century church, and about how um, the apostles assigned people to task, how they, they went and they prayed and they pressed in and, and they, um, the apostles actually told the people, you pray, you press in, we'll just kind of leave the thing and, and press in and pick seven people, seven guys. And we find that Stephen was one of those guys that was chosen. Now, Stephen was a man that they said was full of faith in uh, chapter 6, verse 8. They said, Stephen, full of faith and power, did wonders and signs among the people. Now, was that what he was called to do? I mean, was that what he was chosen to do? What was it that he was chosen to do just before that? He was chosen to help serve, help um, orchestrate the dividing of the widows and orphans, the, the daily needs for the widows and orphans, the serving of the tables, the all of the administrative duties of that. But yet we see here Stephen, full of faith, that signs and wonders are happening. So, can God only use prophets, teachers, evangelists, and pastors to do signs and wonders? No. Can God use the church janitor to do signs and wonders? Right? Yes. Can God use the Sunday school teachers? Can God use, I've seen God use children to lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. I've seen a church janitor lead a man to the Lord right there. He's cleaning the church and this guy comes in and just starts talking to him and he leads him to the Lord. I've seen a church secretary minister to people. So just because we might have a place where we're serving within the body of Christ doesn't mean that we're not all called to operate in all of the gifts. And that's part of a, what we're going to discuss in open heaven. So, but Stephen, full of faith and power and great wonders and signs among the people, did great some wonders and signs among the people. So, I'm just going to move quickly through this first part. We looked at that all of us are called. All of us are called. We are the body of Christ. We are each called. Not a one of us is less than. And this is what I love is this text talked about. He was an administrator. He was administering the food, the provisions to the widows and orphans. And yet God was using him in mighty ways. So like we say in, uh, in Ephesians and Corinthians, when they were talking about the fact that, well, what if the one part of the body says, I'm not needed? It is. It's needed. Each part of the body says that I'm less than another. I've seen a janitor. I've seen, like I said, I've seen someone out doing landscaping minister to a guy walking on the streets homeless. You know what? God places us in specific places for specific times of ministry. He uses us each and every place. He uses each and every one of us. So when we think that we're not needed, guess what? We're missing opportunities of ministry. We're missing opportunities of being blessings to others. I'll tell you what, how many of you were blessed by having a worship team today? I was. I was blessed. I'll tell you what, else. I grabbed the tambourine and stuff, but I was about I'm like, you know, I'm going to be at least decent enough to ask permission to do the tambourine because I've, I've been a drummer for 21 years. And I'll tell you what, I've been there where you're like playing drums and somebody all of a sudden they grab a tambourine and they're like, they're shaking like, and you're going, all happy all over the place. Oh Lord, break that tambourine. I've been there. I'm sorry. That's like, uh, come on. Is it not a drummer's nemesis? A tambourine. I had a nightmare one night. I went to a church and there was five ladies on the front row. Bless God. I mean, I love the fact that people love and praise God. There was five ladies, and they all had tambourines, and they were going to town, just praising the Lord. But I was blessed, Lord. I would be had a drum shield, and I had no way of hearing it. <laughs> so I was going, "Thank you, Lord." 
But I went home and had nightmares that, uh, that I came to a church and there was 150 congregation members and we went to do worship and all of a sudden 150 tambourines came up and went, ah! <laughs> So, sorry, it's just my side note. I, I really, that's why I was like, I grabbed him and I said, I'm going to wait. I'm going to be respectful and wait. I'm going to ask. <laughs> so, but I'll tell you what, I loved it. I was blessed because of the worship today. I know you guys were blessed because of the worship because they came and they served. They said, you know what, we have an ability and you have a need. And I love it. He, he texted me. It was just funny. But two days ago, I think it was, we had just come out of the prayer room. We were just praying, oh Lord, here we are. God, do what you're going to do and just work, Lord. We're just, Lord, we, we need these things. We want these things, Lord. We're praying. And I was just praying and I walked back in my office and Okay, first of all, I don't know the number. And I'm going, yeah, there's someone saying, do you want a worship team? Or, you know, do you need a, something about, some worship team? I'm going, I don't even know this guy. Why would I say yes? <laughs> you know, and so I'm like, I'm going to call. Wisdom says call, you know, because I don't want to say, sure. And all of a sudden, Kiss shows up on my doorstep saying, we're going to do worship, man. <laughs> yeah, don't think so. <laughs> so, but, uh. Praise God. Thank you for not dressing like Kiss and showing up. <laughs> because I told him about that, and I was like, yeah, you know, I just wanted to. But uh, Travis Harding, one of, uh, one of my brothers in Christ uh, over at Eagle Point, uh, he's a part of their, their part of his worship team and stuff. And uh, he said, thumbs up, A OK. So I said, I don't want you guys to think that I just don't want anybody to come up on the stage and just do it. I got a guitar, have trouble travel. No. Obviously, God calls us, but God also um, gives us wisdom, too, who to bring in and who not, and send it out. So, but they had a gift. They have a gift, and they're using that gift. He told me, like he said this morning, oh, it broke my heart when I heard you guys are doing YouTube worship. He says, no! <laughs> so, praise God. And you're so dead on. There's so many musicians across this valley, and like you said, for them to say that... Uh, that we don't have a place to play. I'm going, come on. What's, that's not true. There's always opportunity to perform. You know what it is? It's being submissive. It's being humble. It's submitting to God and allowing God to use those things. And from what I've seen of this group, they are submissive. They love the Lord with all their heart. So, praise God. Travis is sharing a little bit with me about their family and friends and stuff. And just, so, in fact, um, it's not my notes, but it's something that I wanted to address with this congregation, talking about the fact that we've all been called. Uh, the Eagle Point Assemblies of God Church is, um, they've been going through some stuff. Some, um, we've been praying for them when we did the 21 days of prayer and fasting uh, with the building, the finances, things like that. And Pastor Travis and I have been up at Bethel and we've been praying with the pastors, and um, that was one of the two churches when when Pastor Lance and I were going around and praying for different churches when he was filling in when they were looking for pastors here and at Eagle Point. Um, I went with him, and I interceded with him, and I prayed over that property, and I prayed over that building with him, and so God kind of built a kindred spirit, and I've always been praying for that church, because I know the financial stuff that they were going through, and um, in my heart, so when Travis and I lived together, it's just a beautiful thing. Him and I were a little different. Both of us are, you know, different. I'm a preacher. I tell stories. Travis is is more of a teacher. He's very expository teaching from what I from what we can gather. So him and I getting there. So it's a beautiful blend. Him and I talking together. We sit there for hours talking at times at the prayer time. So we get down to prayer. Yes, we do. But. Um, the Lord has just brought an opportunity that we're praying through. And um, their church with the things that are going on. I hope this doesn't make you guys uncomfortable with me sharing. Travis, I told Travis that I wouldn't share with our congregation until after he'd share with his. And then all of a sudden he dropped the bomb on me. And I was like, I had to share with our congregation. Okay, then I guess I better uh, make this known. Um, we are looking at a merge of um, their church joining us. Um, 
and we would be working together for the kingdom. You know, we're going to make what the devil is trying to destroy, and we're going to band together as brothers and sisters in arms, and um, if God be willing, we will be merging the two congregations together. And um, Pastor Travis has, uh, he has talked about um, that he, was, he said that he wants to come in and be the assistant here, which I'm thanking God because you know what? I, love, I want to do so much more, but just with, we need more hands, more bodies, more. And Pastor Travis, I think it'll be a great thing because he's a teacher, like I said. And him and I working together in ministry, I think it'd be a beautiful blend. We're, we love each other. And he has a worship team, and we don't. We have a secretary and a treasurer, and they don't. So I'm going, hmm. I see something here, you know. I see some puzzle pieces coming together. And he's got a group of guys and ladies that are just love evangelism, as this group right here is that, from what we've talked about, they've done street ministry and stuff, and I'm, you know, foaming at the, foaming, wiping my jaws, like, Lord, thank you. I would love to, even if they don't merge, Lord, continue to working together in evangelism, because that's part of what we're called to do, is evangelize and share together. So we would be looking at this at this merge, and their congregation is actually about the same size as ours, a little bit bigger maybe, um, but it would be a beautiful thing, because it will help them, and it will help us. And I believe that that's what God does, is as the body of Christ would come together and worship together. And um, praise God, we're not going to leave Eagle Point out to dry. We're going to minister there. We're going to do outreaches in Eagle Point. We're going to press in. We're going to press in for White City. How many of you know that my heart is for the valley? My heart is not just for White City. My heart is for the valley. Um, that's why we did the 21 days of prayer and fasting and went around to the different churches and prayed and prayed for their pastors and prayed over them and laid hands on them and prayed that they would have boldness to continue to press in, to continue to do and speak the word of God. And that's what this whole thing was about. This, where Paul Harvey was talking about. Isn't it interesting? We're coming into a day and age where Christianity, first of all, is not popular. There was a day when this nation was called a Christian nation. No longer. There was a day when we, as believers, were the majority. There's still, when they take their polls and stuff, they still say that um, America is still a Christian nation. But I got to tell you, it's more of a New Age Christian nation. New Age has crept into the church. Lies have crept into the church. Just go and look at our voting records. Just go and look at the fact that if we were still a God-fearing Christian nation, there are things that are going on that would not be legal. Some of you know I'm pretty hard on the fact that I hate the sin. I love the sinner. That's how Christ was. He hated the sin. He loved the sinner. The Bible tells us also that in Matthew 24, if we want to turn there, that we are going to face many trials and tribulations. And I'll be honest with you, I it just burns me up when I hear someone preaching a gospel that says it will all be good just accept Jesus Christ and it's smooth sailing. You preach that to the 12 apostles. It will all be good. There's only one apostle that got away without being crucified, hung. There's only one of them and he died of old age in prison. That was John. All of the other apostles persecuted. You tell the church in China that when you accept Christ that all will be good. Now, God is good and he is. He gives us peace, joy, and mercy. But he never promised that we would be blessed with a three-story mansion and having in heaven 
but not on earth. I mean, these, these preachers that say that, that say that come to Jesus and all will be hunky-dory. That's wrong. That's not even scripturally Because if it was scripturally, we wouldn't have passages like James. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials and tribulations. Going at the testing of your faith. That's like telling a kid when he's born that he's never going to get a bubble with. Or telling, or telling someone you're never going to go through struggles in your family. We will. We will. So, I'm sorry if that's a side note. I don't get a little... Sometimes when I hear that, I'm going, You go! Hell, man! I'm I hear this sometimes on TV. I just go, I want to throw something at the TV. Like, you are a liar. So, let's go to Matthew real quick. Matthew 24. And we're going to start in verse 4. Remember, there is good. There is a hope. That's what the gospel message is about. So, and Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceive you, for many will come in my name and say, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. I love that. I love that. You know, you can turn on the TV. And you know, with the things that's going on with Israel, with the things that's going on in the Middle East, you can be so troubled. We can sit here and look at, like you're saying, look at our stock market, look at everything. But like I said right at the beginning of service, we got four or five people in this congregation that are employed right now because they haven't looked at the world society and the world's economic the world's economics, they look to God's economics and they know that God says that he will provide and they have prayed and pressed in and they now have employment. And probably one of the worst employment since the depression. They have employment. The world would say, woe is me. Woe is me. Throw ashes on my head, bury my hands in the sand. All is dead. But God says, right here, there's going to be rumors of war. There's going to be people going to be trying to deceive you. But see that you are not troubled. And I love that text that says, For I have overcome the world. That was Jesus. For I have overcome the world. But in here it says, All these things must come to pass. So I love that I was sharing with somebody we were talking about the, uh, the election. And they were just kind of bummed out about it. And I said, you know, whether you're for Romney or against Romney or for Obama or against Obama, Scripture tells us that God puts a man in power and God takes a man down. God knew. God didn't wake up the next morning and go, whoa, what happened? God knew. Amen. God knew. Our job is to pray for those who are in authority above us, that they will make wise decisions. Just like the Bible tells us to pray for our parents. I used to, when I worked with teenagers, I used to say, you know what? Let me tell you something. Here's a clue. Pray for your mom and dad. Because let me tell you what. If mom and dad are having a good day, chances are you're going to have a good day. <laughs> If mom and dad come home and they've had a bad day, chances are you're not going to have too good of a night, especially if you've done, shown them your report card, you've done something wrong. I'm going, pray. I told him, I said, I used to not do good in school, but you know what? That was because of other things. But I'll tell you what, I didn't believe in God, but I still prayed <laughs> when I came home. So, Lord. But listen, I tell these kids, pray for your parents. Because when things are good with mom and dad, things are good with us. I'm going, it might sound like a selfish prayer, but it's a good prayer. 
And that's what I tell us adults. Pray for those who are in authority over us in Washington, that they would have a good day and that they will be wise. Because guess what? If they're having a good day and they're wise, then we will be blessed. <laughs> so we pray and we press in. So, I love that. For nation will rise against nation. But it says, but the end has not yet come. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. And all these things are the beginning sorrows. Did you know that when Jesus set this text out, when he said that um, in the last days, that he was talking about from that point on, that that would be the last days? We are in the last of the last of the last of the last sliver of days right now. We're at the last letter right before the period of the last days. They were at the quote unquote the beginning of the last days at that moment in time. In fact, the Catholics believe that they're, I actually was talking to my mother-in-law and she's a Catholic and we, I love to sit down with them and have discussions and with her aunts and uncles and stuff. And um, they look at, they believe that we're in the, if I stated it correctly, that we're in the millennial reign because they believe that Nero was the Antichrist because of the way that he burned the, burned the temple and everything like that. But how many of you know that when God speaks, God speaks to present, past, and he also speaks to future things throughout Scripture. He lays it out there, and he's talking to a future, and that's why it says that the word is alive. It can be used yesterday, today, and it can always be used because I love, I love when people come to me and say, well, that's an old book. I'm going, dude, let me tell you what. That old book has some good things because it tells me if I do this, this is going to happen. And let me tell you what, I've had things like that happen. Or if this, you say this, you do this, guess what? That's going to happen. I'm going, maybe you should be reading it a little more <laughs> because uh, there's some wisdom in there. It says even a fool is not wise when he keeps his mouth shut. I'm going, I've been there. I've seen those fools. <laughs> I've been there. I've been one of those people. I'm going, the scripture goes flat out. It said, it is a lie. It can speak to you. I love it when people come to me after service. I preached one sermon, and all of a sudden they came up and said, Pastor, that was so blessed. You know, that spoke to my heart. And they're talking about something that's totally different. I'm going, well, we on the same day. We attended church the same day. God spoke to you about this. I'm going, oh, Holy Spirit must have thought my message wasn't good enough. Because uh, he had a whole different message for this person or that person. But you know how many of you know one scripture can speak to everyone in a different way? Because God customizes it. It is customized. It speaks to our bone. It speaks to our heart. And that's where God is. Oh. Where was I? Oh. And all these things at the beginning of sorrow. Then they will deliver you up in the tribulation and kill you. Okay, maybe that's not so happy. But no. <laughs> they will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be will be offended. How many of you have been there? Where you being a Christian alone has offended somebody? Yeah. Or your actions or walking with integrity has offended somebody. And how hard is it nowadays to walk with integrity? How hard is it? It is very hard to walk with integrity. With God's integrity, not Simi Quasar integrity, but God's integrity. It is hard to walk with that integrity. And it's because of the fact we are in that day. So, but you know, this might sound like a bummer, but for us, guess what? There is, there is hope. They will be offended. And will betray one another and they will hate one another. How many of you have seen that? People are turning on parents, turning on family members. I mean, it's just infighting and outfighting. And I mean, I see it over and over. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And how many of us have seen that? Waco, Texas, Jim Jones, Drink Kool Aid, the group in 2000 when they were proclaiming. Haley Bob's comment, put on their Nikes. 
We've got others that have come and deceived. We've got many different things. Many false prophets will rise up and will deceive many. And because the lawlessness will abound, come on, how many of us now we see this? Someone breaks in your home, breaks their leg, and they can sue you? Yeah. I'm going, yeah, I think, you were, I think you're not even looking at the Ten Commandments. Hello, right there, you know? I'm going, it serves you right, break into my house and trip over one of my kids' toys. Guess what? I'm going to make you buy my kid a new toy. <laughs> so that lawlessness abounds. The love of many will go cold. How many of us have seen that? Wow. Lawlessness and lovelessness. It's here. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. Then the end will come. And that right there, I'm going, woo-hoo! You know, some of you have been there where I've come to talk to people. I talk to people when I see people haven't been in church. You know what? I don't come to people and talk to them about not being in church or pray with them and call them about not being in church because I want to see the numbers. That's not it. It's because there's a scripture in Ephesians that talks about the fact that do not forsake the meaning of the assemblies together as some have because it says that they will be deceived. I know so many people that they stop fellowshipping with brothers and sisters and they get hammered. They get hammered. Satan starts beating them down. And so I, I go and I visit some of, our, some of the ladies in our church that are now becoming shut-ins. I try and I go visit them and I try and I go visit some of the people and I say, hey, just talk with them, love on them, because guess what? We've got to remember each other. That's why I've challenged us to pray for one another, to call one another. When you've seen people not here, you say, hey, how you doing? You know, I love Larry's ministry. Every week he calls and reminds people, how you doing? It's Saturday. Don't forget church tomorrow. I mean, I get a call. I'll be sitting in my church office. How you doing? Hey, Larry, how's it going? Don't forget tomorrow. Oh, you know, let me put that on my appointment calendar. It's Sunday. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you reminded me, Larry. It's tomorrow Sunday. Hey, all right. <laughs> I love it, Larry. Oh, we harass each other. There's been times where I've tried to beat him to the punch, and he's beat me to the call. Darn, okay, next week I'll get him. But you know what? Calling one another, encouraging one another. The Bible tells us to do that. That's a part of being the body of believers, is encouraging one another, lifting one another up. When we're down, when we're weak, when we're going through hell. This last three weeks, of, we've been going through it. Three weeks ago, my wife's dad had a stroke. Most of you know that. Um, praise God. He's doing, doing great now. Um, in fact, he tried to go back to work the next night for an hour. <laughs> and then you top it off and, you know, the next week, her aunt calls and she's got stage four lung cancer. It's gone and out her it's in the bone. Um, and she's the only believer other than her and her brother, Steve, in the family. And then you go to the fact that um, just some things this last week, um, our van went in the shop and said goodbye to the motor, or the hand, I don't know which it is, whatever it is. We're like, oh, one thing after another, you know? And you know, my mother being hospitalized, and on Thanksgiving, we're sitting at Thanksgiving, and my sister and her husband start screaming at each other in front of the whole family. and. Uh, all of a sudden, they start throwing the D word out there. And that night, he started packing up all of his stuff and packing up all of her stuff and started the whole divorce proceedings. Go on. Now I know I don't come from any Thanksgiving. <laughs> no. no, right there, Thanksgiving dinner. I'm going, praise God. Whatever, God, you're going to do. I don't know. But you know what? We can't focus on that. We can't focus on the stuff of this world. The Bible tells us 
That's why Jesus said that. Was but be a good heart. Guess what? Look up. Press in. Rejoice and advance the kingdom of heaven. Acts or Matthew. In Acts we see that Stephen was martyred. But the beauty is in the end here, because he was preaching to the priests, and I'm not going to go through their whole their whole thing that he talked about, his whole sermon, if you want to call it to the priests, but he was telling them basically taking them back to the beginning of their history for the Jews. And then he went and he said this starting in verse 54 of Acts. Then the, when the priests heard these things, it's Acts 6, verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to their heart. How many of you know that when you keep your focus on God, when you're pressed into God, when you are in His presence, that what you have to say, the power of the living Word, and what you say, if you're aligned with Him and abiding with Him, that it will cut to the heart of those around you. Good or bad for them. Good for us. Sometimes it's good for them when they come to the Lord. Bad if they don't want to because then they, they're going to hate us. So, and they gnashed their teeth, but he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed up into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Ooh, would that not be an awesome vision? Amen. Seeing God, seeing Jesus, and said, See, the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Ooh, and it says they cried out with a loud voice. Their ears stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. Not stoned as in, but stoned as in the rocks. Okay, just for clarification. <laughs> Some people are like, that's a good thing. No, it's not. <laughs> so, they cast him down, they stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their cloaks at the feet of, hey, hey, I want you to note this, and a man named Saul. Keep that note there. Put that in your note. We're going to be talking about that next week. A man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling out to God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Here is the key, is a key. He could not have asked God to forgive them. He could not have been at peace unless he was in the presence of God. Unless he was not focused on this world and the things that were going on. But he had his eyes fixed in the heavens. How many of you know that it's hard to see an open heaven when you're looking at everything around you? When you're looking at this, when you're looking at what's going on around you, you're not looking to heaven. You know, one of the first things I remembered when I was learning how to drive was, and you know, it's one of those things, you learn it, and then you do it, and you realize, ouch, that's why. At night when you're driving, how many of you know you can keep on looking straight? You don't look to the headlights of the car that's coming at you. What happens? You go, you get spots in your eyes. And they said that when you focus on those things, you end up leaning towards those things. And you know, how many of you know that if we focus on the junk that's going on around us, we're going to end up being just like the world in the fact that we're going to be just as miserable we're going to be just as heartbroken. We're going to be just as broken and hopeless. But we have a hope beyond that. Amen. We have a hope that lies in Jesus Christ. Those songs being washed in the blood. My chains fell off. My chains fell off. Press in. 
rejoice and advance the kingdom. Matthew 6, we see it so much. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. We see also in Matthew where He says, in what is the way He taught us to pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be that name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. We focus to heaven, to his kingdom. Keep our focus on that cross. I love the fact that during Christmas time we light it up in red. We light it up in red because it reminds me that, you know what? It's the cross. It's the blood. It's the blood of Christ. Yes, we have our Christmas tree over here, but you know what? The cross is prominent. The cross is always prominent. Rejoice. Philippians tells us to focus and meditate on these things which are pure, wholesome, holy, praiseworthy. Because when you're doing that, woo -woo -woo, I've had someone call me just this week. They called me and said, start a pastor. This is going on. This is going on. Just read me. I mean, it, it felt like they were reading me a letter on just things that were just horrible that were going on. I'm going, you know what? And they said, pray for me. I'm going, okay. Lord, I thank you that this person still has a home. And they were kind of like shocked at the beginning. It's like, thank you, God, that this person has a roof over their head. Thank you, God, that they're able to call me. That means the electricity's still on. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, that they've got a phone still. Thank you, Lord, that they've got a vehicle that's running. Thank you, Lord, that, they're, that they have health, that they've got breath. Lord, yes, their health might not be good, but God, thank you that they're able to make a phone call, that they're able to talk. Lord, thank you that they are saved, that no matter what, that the enemy cannot snatch them out of the pit of hell. Thank you that the enemy cannot snatch them and bring them into the pit of hell. Excuse me. But thank you, God, for this person. And you know, by the time we got off the phone, they're like, oh, thank you. I want, that's how you should be focused. Rejoice. Count your, I love that song, Count Your Blessings One by One. Count them. When we wake up in the morning and the enemy is right there trying to read us our mail, saying, you got five bills. You've got mail. you got seven bills. You can't pay them all. You know, I'm going, well, praise God. Because <laughs> I'm still in the kingdom of heaven. You can't take that one. If that's an email to me, that's a spam, and it's from you, and I'm not going to receive it. Amen. <laughs> I love this. We're, we do this in the prayer room. We have the one room set up as a prayer room. And this is the last thing I want you to think about. It's a little quote. It's not a scripture, but it's a quote. And it goes along with uh, Luke 17, 5. It says, increase our faith, Lord. But it says, little faith in Christ Jesus will bring your soul to heaven. Great faith will bring heaven to your soul. So this morning, my question is to you is, where's your focus? Are you worried about the trials and tribulations? Because James tells us not to. Or are we focused on heaven? Are we focused on the kingdom of God? I had a pastor that, he died from colon cancer, but I'll tell you what. This man's on his deathbed, and he's calling me up and saying, hey, I'm praying for you. He goes, how's your sinus infection going on? What? <laughs> I've got a sinus infection, and you're praying for me? He goes, every time I get pain, he goes, I pray for someone. Because you know what? That's just another kick in Satan's teeth. He goes, and I'm going to go out fight. I don't know about you. How many of us are going out fighting? When it comes time, I'm going to go before the Lord and I want to say, I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. We have been chosen by God to be born in this day and this hour to advance the kingdom of heaven, to press in, to show the glory of God, to be the glory of God, to show people the kingdom of heaven to 
praying for people, to lay hands on people, to watch the sick recover, to grab the things of heaven and bring them to earth. To say, you need healing? There it is in Jesus' name. You need a hope? Let me tell you about Jesus. I want to take as many to heaven as I can when I go. I was saying, Jesus, look at all these guys. Woo-hoo. Oh, yeah, I got some, got some bruises, but praise God. At least they're not going to hell. Where is our focus? Is it heaven? Are we heaven minded? Are we heaven bound? Is our focus looking up to the open heaven? Or is our focus to this world? Let's pray. This morning I'm going to give opportunity if there's anyone here that you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want to tell you that you have no hope beyond this. But Jesus Christ gives you a hope because he died on the cross 2,000 years ago for you. He died on the cross for you. He saw you. You know, the Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten Son to die for you and me. He died and he rose again. He died because he knew that's what it was going to take in order for you to get into heaven. He rose again to show you that he has overcome this world and to show you that you can overcome too through his blood. It says, For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten Son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I want you to have everlasting life. And if you say, I look at this stuff around me and I have no hope, then you're right. But there is a hope in Christ. We've started to do something different here. While well, everybody's got their heads bowed and their eyes closed, if you're saying you want to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'll be honest with you, I'd like you to stand. Because there's going to be numbers of times that you're going to be asked to stand in this world. Jesus loves you. you're saying, Pastor, I've had a struggle this week. I've had some struggles. I just want prayer. You can come over for prayer. We'll pray for you today. We're not here to point fingers or guilt anybody or anything like that. But if you need prayer, come forward. We'll pray for you. on you, that we will be focused on heaven, on an open heaven, and Lord, we're going to continue to talk about the open heaven, that we will be focused on who you are, and that you are an overcomer, and God, we can do all things through you, we can do all things through Christ Jesus, who strengthens us. And God, during this week, I pray that our devotional times will be powerful. Our prayer times, our times with you would be powerful. 
that they will be encouraging, that they will be strong. And I thank you, God, that you are always an encourager, that you always lead us. I pray that you bless each person here. I pray that you would give them strength through this week, God. Give them strength. Give them courage. Help them to be a light. Help us all to be a light, Father God, this week. And help us all to be salt. And help us all to continue to remember that you died and rose for us. Pray that you would bless each person here as they come and as they go. In all their business dealings, in all of their um, home situations and everything, Lord, I pray that you would bless. Bless these families that are represented here. I pray that there would be blessings of more salvations within the homes. I pray that your hand would guide each one of us. And those of us that own businesses, Lord, I pray that you would bless. Bless them, Lord. And those of us that are working, I pray that you would bless our hand that would prosper, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Bless you guys. Save me, O oh God, renew my life again. You are the Lamb that was slain. And hear me, O oh God, do not hide your face. Take me to your holy place. You are. 